<laughs> Lovely. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone, and a happy new year if I've not seen you uh, so far this, this year. Um, if we could all remember to mute so uh, we don't get any background noises during the, during the talk. Um, but uh, tonight I'd like to welcome uh, as our speaker, Anna Forbes, who is Senior Project Officer and Volunteer Coordinator, in other words, the public face uh, for ARC, the Action for the River Kennet. Having had some contact with Anna on several occasions, including a webinar uh, run by the North Wessex Downs Area of Outstanding Natural be Beauty, uh, talking about their Sparkling Streams project, I can attest to her passionate advocacy of the River Kennet. And I, for one, and I'm sure all of you, are really looking forward to hearing about the work done by ARC this evening and uh, over to you Anna. Thank you very much Sue yeah it's been really nice to be invited to do a presentation with you this evening so I'm going to go straight into sharing my screen and taking you through lots of different aspects of ARC but please feel free to ask any questions and just to keep an eye out in the background in case the eel which is probably about 25 centimetres long now. Margaret the eel swims around at all. So she's a European eel, which is a species of eel that we have in our rivers. But eels are actually now critically endangered. And she is one that's um, from one of our eels in school projects that I've kept back so that we can take her out and about to talks when we're doing in-person talks and go around to schools so that people have the opportunity to learn and see eels firsthand because actually you're very lucky if you are ever get to actually see one in the wild. So I'm just going to see if that will share and just see if I can get my screen to go into full size screen. Might be a little bit slow. There we go. Is that all okay with you? Excellent. So I've called the talk this evening from water voles to yellow fish, which will hopefully become evident what yellow fish are as I go through the presentation. So for any of you who are not aware of ARC, it's Action for the River Kennet, and we are the Rivers Trust for the Kennet catchment and now also for the Pang catchment also. So we're working on the Kennet and its tributaries and also the River Pang. ARC started out over 25 years ago, started by some passionate anglers who had noticed the decline in our precious chalk streams. And their main focus was about trying to reduce or stop the abstraction on the Kennet, the taking of huge quantities of water. And that's something that ARC have had some success with. We still continue with dialogue with Thames Water because we still think the river is under far too much pressure with abstraction, as well as a whole host of other issues that I think some of you are probably very familiar with. Um, but we have made some headway with that, but we've also diversified into a whole host of other ways of trying to look after our river and engage people with caring about the river and understanding it and getting involved if they want to as well. So this is just a map showing you the Kennet catchments. So the River Kennet starting all the way up near Avebury and the source of the Kennet being Swallowhead Springs. So where the Kennet first rises out from the ground and starts to flow, going all the way through Marlborough, through Hungerford, through to Newbury, all the way down to Reading, where it then goes into the River Thames. And it's, Kennet is the biggest tributary to the River Thames. But obviously you are probably all very much aware of the River Lambourne, a really significant tributary to the Kennet. And we've done quite a lot of work on the Lambourne, particularly last year we started a project called Love the Lambourne. And we're going to be continuing with that this year as well. So the Kennet and the Lambourne are chalk streams. So that's an internationally rare, very special type of river. There's only just over 200 of these chalk streams in the whole of the world. And over 80 of them are here, in, in, in 180 of them are here in England. So we have more of these chalk streams here than any other country in the world. And so just because they're on our doorstep, they shouldn't be taken for granted. They're 
really important. They have a whole unique set of reasons why they're important and together, and I'm just going to talk you through these, why they support when they're healthy, a wealth of wildlife. So they're homes to iconic wildlife, they're globally rare, and they are also our water supply. They are constantly cold. Chalk streams, whether you dip your toes into them in spring, summer, winter or autumn, they're always about 10 degrees. And the Lambourne is actually even colder than that, as our volunteers find out when they lower themselves into their wade in their waders for the first time. That even on a bright summer's day, the water is still very cold. The water should be crystal clear. And that's a sign like you can see in this picture where you can see the clean gravel riverbed. So they should also have lots of marginal vegetation that helps keep them healthy and is very good for wildlife as well. So people don't always realize why the water is crystal clear. And it's because chalk streams are what are called ground water fed, meaning that when it rains, the rain goes soaking down through the soil and below the soil to the chalk geology. And chalk, as you will realize, is a very porous stone. So the rainwater is able to filter down through the chalk and get really clean. And then eventually, when we've had a really wet winter, that aquifer, the chalk aquifer underground gets saturated like a sponge that's full of water and that eventually is what will come back up through springs and feed our river. So the wildlife, a lot of it that lives in the river, has evolved to need that really cool, clean, well oxygenated, flowing clear water. And this is a photo from the Kennet in the village of Minel, or proper name Mildenhall, just downstream of Marlborough. And that's kind of an example of what a healthy chalk stream should look like with lots of aquatic vegetation, marginal vegetation, and a mixture of light and shade and kind of good flow to keep those gravels nice and clean because that's what's really important for the little invertebrates that live in the riverbed to have gravel that's clean and not clogged up with silt. So this is just a small selection of the creatures that you might be lucky enough to see in or by your chalk streams, kingfishers, otters, fish like that's a grayling or water voles or insects like the banded demoiselle are all creatures you'd expect to see in and by your river. So this is just a picture of abstraction to illustrate that drought isn't something that just happens in other countries. This is the River Kennet in Marlborough about 11 years ago when we'd had a really long dry summer and people had started using huge quantities of water because I think water is just on tap here. People take it for granted and don't treat it like the precious resource it actually is. And the more water we all use, the more water our water company, Thames Water, will take. They will abstract that water from creating a borehole down into that chalk aquifer. And so this isn't a winterbourne, this stretch of river. This is a stretch of river that should flow all year round. And it dried up so quickly that the fish that people did try to rescue and it didn't work. They, the, most of them died because it was obviously very stressful for them being moved and they didn't survive that. So it's important for us not to have bits of river drying up that shouldn't be. And so with every kind of talk, whether it's with grown ups or with children, we want people to realise to be as water efficient, not only for your water bills, but to look after your rivers, because the less we use, the more that's left to reach our rivers and keep them flowing and keep the wildlife thriving. So this is just a little illustration of showing the rain coming down, going down into the chalk aquifer and the springs then feeding our rivers. So not only does the Kennet suffer from abstraction, and we've had, as I said earlier, successes with no longer is water taken from the River Og on a regular basis. And the Og is a little tributary that comes into the Kennet in Marlborough. And so there are lots of things we're trying to do to reduce people wa using water, but equally there's pollution. And I think a lot of you are probably very aware of the, our chalk streams. And there's been a lot of press now about the different reasons, whether it's sewage pollution, agricultural pollution, and other kinds of pollution too. And it's not just big water companies. There are lots of small things going on as well, where people who 
and it is only small, but collectively, when you've got lots of people that put their compost heaps at the bottom of their garden, if their garden goes down to the river, that can then leach nutrients into the river also. So if you know anyone that has compost heaps or great big piles of kind of anything like that's nutrient rich at the bottom of their garden, it's important to try and keep them as far away from the river as possible. This is um, a photograph that our director took last year of the River Shalbourne or the Shalbourne Stream, which is a tributary to the Dun, which then goes into the Kennet. And this should be a lovely clean gravel riverbed, but you can see that it's heavily polluted. And our project called Sparkling Streams that's still running at the moment is doing lots to try and address the pollution that's happening on the Shalbourne. We've done lots and lots of tree planting to try and slow the flow of water so that rain doesn't carry lots of sediment and silt into the river. It has a chance the rain to go down into the ground and get that flow slowed by having lots of trees, the right trees planted in the right places. And we've built a rain garden at Shalbourne Primary School, which is kind of inspiring the school, the parents and other people to understand about creating places for rain to slowly filter back into the ground so we don't have huge amounts of runoff going directly into the river taking nutrient loads with it. So this is a slide just showing the wealth of different things that ARC is doing. So as a small rivers trust and a charity and um, we have now six employees and we are, some of us, are, not all of us are full time, but we're doing a lot of different work in a lot of different areas, trying to do all these different things from monitoring to surveying, community engagement, water vol surveying, creating wetlands, because there's so many different ways we can try and help our rivers hang on in there and make them resilient rivers so that as we have climate change and other pressures, our rivers are in a stronger position to cope with what is often a lot of abuse that they are facing. We go around trying to teach people about healthy habitats. As humans, many have a, an instinct to want to tidy things or sanitize things. And for a healthy chalk river, we don't want that. We don't want straight channels. We don't want, like in picture A, that's the River Kennet in Reading, a straight channel that's got hard engineered river banks that will have some wildlife living in it, but not an awful lot compared to the picture in picture B, which is the River Kennet in Marlborough. And that's a site that ARC jointly own called Stonebridge Wild River Reserve, which is a site that is the River Kennet flowing through it with 15 acres of water meadow. And it's public, open to the public, all the time and it's whatever the season it's a lovely place to visit if you visit at the moment you'll need to wear your wellies because it's a water meadow but in the summer it dries up and it's a good example of how to manage a river we've got that really good vegetation at the banks which is cover for fish it's connectivity for the creatures like water vole if people mow everything into oblivion, you're not going to have creatures like water vole because they need lots and lots of plants to eat and places to hide from predators. Having trees for shade is important, but not too many because you also need to have light to enable that plant that you can see growing with the little white flowers is called stream water crowfoot. And we've worked with volunteers over a number of years now to re-establish stream water crowfoot at various locations on the Kennet and on the River Lambourne, we started replanting it last year in Newbury because it's such a great plant. If any of you have watched the new David Attenborough program, it featured this plant at the weekend on the episode there. It's not only is it great for little invertebrates to live amongst, so if you've got more invertebrates, you've got more food for other creatures like the fish. But when the flowers come up above the surface, they're good for pollinating insects, but also water voles love to eat the flowers. And so if you want to see a water vole in the summer, this is a really good place to go to because we've got a really good population there. And they'll quite often be sat on the mats of the crowfoot, just munching their way through the flowers. So when we're going around doing lots of practical habitat river restoration, we're always looking at what we can do to site and trying to connect more and more bits of healthy river so that wildlife can safely 
travel, whether it's a waterfall, swimming or a fish, to get them up and downstream so that if there are pollution incidents, they can move to another area. Or if they're breeding, they've got another area that their young can go and disperse into because you can have lots of creatures, but if they haven't got anywhere for their young to move into, you're going to get what is called bottlenecking and we don't want that. So we're also looking into barriers on the River Kennet. We've had a project this year called um, the Thames Catchment Community Eels Project, which is a joined up project with other rivers trusts. And we've had volunteers trained up out with a new project officer identifying barriers to eel migration. And so all those barriers have been logged and then we're strategically able to plan which barriers are the best ones to get rid of to allow eels to migrate up the river. And if we're we end up removing those barriers, that's gonna be a win for lots of other creatures as well as the eels. So if the river's healthy, it won't have barriers, but it will have aquatic plants, marginal vegetation, clean gravel riverbed, a meandering channel, overhanging trees, and plenty of unpolluted flowing water. So that's our kind of ideal site. We have hundreds of volunteers working with us pretty much every week of the year throughout the year, contributing thousands of hours. And without our volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do half the work we do because we're able to deliver really good practical projects very efficiently and economically because many of our volunteers have been with us now for sometimes seven or eight years or more. And so they're really skilled themselves in knowing how to do good quality river restoration. It's a great way of meeting like-minded individuals of all ages and backgrounds and having really good fun in waders, but doing something really good, getting access to lots of bits of land and river you normally wouldn't get to have access on because we work on public and private stretches of river. And volunteers are welcome to come along as often or as little as they like. We run tasks that are often all day, but if someone only wants to come and do the morning, as long as they let us know, that's absolutely fine. Some people like to just volunteer really locally. Some are happy to travel and that's all great. And we welcome people. Some people like to stay and only do the land based tasks. Other people can't wait to get in the river, but we have there's no reason why we can't accommodate most people. Our, our youngest volunteers are sometimes the cubs and the beavers and the scouts going through to we've got a volunteer who's in his 80s. So we try and accommodate everybody. We work to improve habitats. This was on the River Dun in Hungerford, and that was at a place called Bearwater, a retirement complex. And we spent, I think, about 14 days on and off over there helping re-meander their river there and then within the same year the second picture is all the plants that have taken after we've put in what are called hazel faggots which are big neat coppice bundles of hazel that help us re kind of re-wiggle meander the river and then we backfill and then we plant up and the plants because they're going straight into water grow very quickly and those plants will consolidate the riverbank, sending out those big roots and prevent further bank erosion, hold the bank together. I think they look a lot more attractive and they're good for the pollinators. They're good for ground nesting birds. And within months of doing that project, voles had moved in because they were living really close by at Freeman's Marsh. And soon as we made the habitat suitable for them, they're able to start living there too. And that was a great project, getting the residents and the staff in the river helping us too. This, if it will play, this is just a little bit, it's not the greatest piece of footage, but it just shows you, oh, is it gonna play? There we go. This was filmed in the water. That's a very plump water bowl in Marlborough when I was in the river doing some work and just spotted it, sat on a piece of wood. And so it's important to know that water voles are not, or sometimes they're known as ratty, but they are not rats. Water voles are Britain's largest vole. They've got a much rounder face, a hairier tail, littler ears, and they have to eat 80% of their body weight in plants every day. And they're quite plump. They're about the size of a little guinea pig. So by having all this marginal vegetation, they've got plenty of food. And if you want to know if you've got water vole along your river, if you look at the vegetation and you can see that the sedge has been 
and the other plants, but sedge is one of their favorites, has been chewed off at a diagonal 45 degree angle. That's how you know it's a water vole that's been eating the plants because of the way their teeth are. That's how that angle is. So it's a great way of seeing if they're about on your river. They're not fussy eaters. They eat over 200 different types of plant that, and they love things like watercress and water mint. So, and they're quite, get quite used to people. So you've got every chance of if you're patient and hang around by a piece of river that you may well see them over kind of spring and summer and early autumn. And then in the winter, although they don't hibernate, they don't come out of their burrows so much, but we've trained volunteers to go out doing water vole surveying for us. So before we do a project, we water vole survey to check whether they are there or not, because then that will dictate how we do our river restoration, because if they are there, they're a protected species and we don't want to do anything that will disturb them. But most of the time we're doing projects that actually end up where they move in and they weren't there at the beginning. Um, I was saying earlier about people tidying up. Another thing we like people to understand is this is an old tree that's fallen backwards. And so you've got the base of the tree up next to the river bank and the holes that I've done the arrow are showing you that's a, um, the holes that a kingfisher has made. So kingfishers in other types of river, they will nest in the river bank, but on a chalk stream, river banks are generally very low. So they rely on these trees going backwards in storms and then using the tree plate to create their burrows to lay their eggs in. And so when people's instincts are, if a tree's gone over that they need to get rid of it. And ideally we would say, just leave it there because that's what the kingfishers use. And we've got in at Stonebridge, we've got three different trees like this, and they've all been used by kingfishers for nesting. So keep an eye out for that. At this time of year, our volunteers are out doing red spotting, which a red is a brown trout nest, an underwater nest. So between November and March, trout are spawning. And because they make these mounds, the first of all, they create a depression. The female lays her eggs in that clean gravel. The male fertilizes them. And then the female uses her tail to disturb more gravel to go over the eggs and protect them. And so our volunteers are walking the riverbanks of, of lots of specific stretches of the Kennet and the Lambourne and a few other tributaries like the Dun and the Og as well. And we've got an app where they then mark every new trout nest they see. And then we know whether trout spawning is beginning to happen earlier or later. We know when the peak of the season was that year and we know the number of nests. So that will give us an idea of how healthy that stretch of river is by the number of trout nests. And so, first of all, it's quite difficult because first people are trying to see these mounds, but once you get your eye in, so it's worth just if you're looking around near a river at the moment, there should be lots of activity with trout. And normally trout are a solitary type of fish. So if they're together at the moment because it's breeding season and keep your eye out for these, these mounds and upstream of the mound will be a depression. And the depression is where that's the gravel that's gone over the top to protect the eggs. And inside that nest can be hundreds and hundreds and sometimes thousands of little eggs. And so at this time of year, if you know a bit of river that's got lots of clean gravel, we'd recommend not getting in it or not letting your dog in it because they're going to just destroy those nests and then all those eggs are just gonna get dispersed and trout have a really tough time and a very low survival rate. It's estimated only about five in every 100 trout will survive the first year. And so if whole nests are being destroyed, that obviously lowers that survival rate even more so. But our volunteers love doing trout nest spotting because it gives them a chance just to have a really leisurely stroll along lots of lovely stretches of river and kind of slow the pace down and just enjoy walking and at the same time giving us lots of good data. And so every day at the moment, I'm being sent really beautiful pictures of different bits of river just because the volunteers are really enjoying getting out red spotting, which is every fortnight they walk that over the spawning season. And if any of these opportunities appeal to you, do get in touch because we're always looking for new people to get involved and take on more volunteering and whether it's red spotting or learning how to do water vole surveying with us or doing our practical volunteering. This is just a short piece of footage of trout spawning and this was filmed by um, a cameraman who came along and did some free filming for us and this was filmed in the river at Hungerford so it just shows how important the clean gravel is for the fish so 
that was just a very short bit, but if there, he's done a lot longer film for us, which is available to watch on our um, the homepage of our um, website. So I talked earlier about pollution. So the picture on the left was when we were out pulling up Himalayan balsam in big volunteer teams. And Himalayan balsam is a, an invasive plant that outcompetes our native plants on the riverbank. And then when the Himalayan balsam dies off, the bank then erodes and all the soil falls in the river and that causes um, smothering of riverbank and the water quality to go down. We spotted, the picture on the left was when we spotted that someone had this massive pile of grass clippings and you can see the colour of the water there is not how a chalk stream should be. So we just tapped on the man's door and just politely said to him about it. And when he came and then looked at it from around where we are, he, he was completely unaware from his garden of the problem he was causing and kind of took the advice really well and now has moved his pile. The picture on the right is of a really bad farm and so we do a lot of work with farmers working with them because for them they want to keep their soil on their land and we don't want that soil in the river so this is just an example of a farmer who wasn't embracing catchment sensitive farming because every time it's running all the chemicals that he's using on that farm are leaching into the river so that's not what we want to see and we want to see farmers and many of them are doing a much healthier buffer strip if they've got river on their land those marginal plants because they will filter the runoff and that's what we want to see lots of nice healthy plants all along the riverbank and also the other thing is people planting cover crops on their farms so that the soil is never left bare there's always plants holding that soil together so better for the farmers and better for the river I mentioned um, yellow fish at the beginning. Oh, my slide's just gone backwards. Just going to see why that's doing that. There we go. So we, you may have seen they were plastic, but now we've got metal ones, because obviously plastic's not the way to go, of these little tokens that we glue to the sides of storm drains saying rainwater only, or some of them say only rainwater down the drain. And it's there's a yellow fish that was the symbol and it's trying to get people to realize that nothing should be being put down storm drains apart from rainwater they were designed to take rainwater away and lead directly into rivers and it's quite common to see people throwing their cigarette ends down them we've seen people putting um when their dog's been to the loo pushing that down the drain and uh, and all kinds of litter and sometimes we've had reports um, of people pouring paint down them. And I don't think a lot of people, it's ignorance. They just don't give it any thought of where, what they put down there, where it goes. So we've got these stickers and we've leafleted doors in lots of towns and villages just to raise awareness so that people realize that they shouldn't be putting anything down those drains at all. And it's been volunteers that have helped us stick probably now thousands of these next to lots of drains. Um, so sometimes there's a solution to rather than the rainwater going straight down the drain and is building wetlands where space permits and where landowners embrace kind of a more creative method of dealing with runoff. And at Stonebridge, where we jointly own it with the town council, we used to have runoff that went down an open culvert straight into the river. And after lots of planning and raising the funding, we then divert, filled in the culvert and diverted everything to come through this wetland. And it looks a bit of a mess there because it was a digger and a lot of plants going in. But eventually it now looks like this. So instead you've got this nice wetland, which is an additional habitat next to the river. So it's a nice still water body with lots of wildlife living in it. But all those plants, by the time the water ever reaches the river, the water is much cleaner because it's filtered through all the different plants that have been put in there. We had Marlborough brownies doing nitrate and phosphate testing over a number of months and years for us, testing the water quality when it came into the wetland, the water quality at the end of the wetland, and then the water quality in the river. And at the end of the wetland, it was actually after all the filtering, it was actually lower in nitrate and phosphate than the river, which proves the effectiveness of how a wetland can be of kind of nature working really well to deal with the amount of stuff that was originally just going straight into the river. And we also put in, you can just see in the bottom right hand corner, a recycled plastic boardwalk. 
and dipping platform. So now people can get into the meadow, even if they're in a mobility scooter or a wheelchair to enjoy it. And also we can use it with lots of children to do pond dipping. And then we go to the river and do river dipping so that children grow up understanding about the different creatures living in these two different water situations. And, and it's a really good way of them kind of enjoying the outdoors in a safe way with us, but learning an awful lot of, at the same time and having lots of fun. We've done, I mentioned earlier, rain gardens, so which is all about embracing suds, sustainable urban drainage systems. We started off a few years ago, this is the front of Preshute Primary School, and together with um, Wendy Allen, who designs our rain gardens for us, she's contracted to do that. And then we work with her and volunteers and create lots of different ways of rain as I said to go slowly into the ground and these were what are called storm water planters and so instead of the um, guttering and the down pipes leading down into the drains they now go down into these planters and so the bright blue pipes make it interesting for the children and we also built some other features out the back like we built them a green roof welly store out the back as well so that the children grow up understanding about their river and understanding that lots of small measures can contribute to a positive change. And we've gone on to do, I think, about five of these rain gardens now. And we've also run over the past year a series of rain planter workshops so that people can take elements at whatever level they want and kind of recreate them in their own gardens at home. It's really important we do a lot of commenting on applications, because as much as we realise there's going to be new builds going on, building on um, water meadows, floodplains is not a wise move. So this is showing you um, the water meadow in Marlborough in the summer and then when we had a very wet winter. So leaving these spaces to be big sponges is really important because if we concrete them over, the water has got to go somewhere. So it's really important to kind of, if you notice something like that going on with an application to let us know as well as commenting yourself because we might not see everything but we're really happy to write in and comment on these things. This is Himalayan balsam. We've spent many years with volunteers in waders pulling up what is a very attractive plant but it's not, it doesn't belong here and as I said earlier it outcompetes our plant. If you ever spot Himalayan balsam anywhere please also let us know. Um, we know that the River Lambourne at various locations has got quite a lot and we want to come back hopefully this summer and carry on. It's at Western we know that there's quite a lot of it growing. We want to try and start tackling that and also down in Reading we know on the Kennet there's a lot growing there and it's one of the, it comes up extremely easily and so it's one of those tasks where we just need many hands to make light work of pulling it up. And it's one of those things that on your own would be really boring, but in a big team, it's 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 good fun because it comes up quite easily and it just needs to be left to compost far away from the riverbank. And it needs repeated visits over normally four or five years to keep out competing it. So it's hard work, but we have successfully eradicated it from a number of sites. So we'll continue to be doing that this year, hopefully. We also do citizen science. This is one of our most successful citizen science projects, which is river fly monitoring. You might see our volunteers in the river with this kind of net and they're out every month at a specific site and they're looking for indicator species of invertebrate that don't tolerate pollution. So river fly monitoring is a national initiative, but ARC is the hub for the Kennet catchment. And we have 62 sites on the River Kennet and its tributaries, and they are all being monitored by trained volunteers who attend an all day workshop with us to learn really good identification skills and good methodology of taking the kick samples. And then they go out and they're looking for things like mayfly larvae and case caddis and freshwater shrimp, these creatures that won't tolerate a lot of pollution. So this is a little map showing you the number of sites we've got and then I've done another one showing you this one specifically trying to show you the sites that we've got on the river Lambourne and the idea is we try and have them up and downstream of sewage treatment works but then also dotted around so that if a pollution incident occurs when a volunteer will phone me and say they've had a trigger level breach 
I can then deploy the other monitors to go up and downstream so we can locate exactly where the pollution begins and for how far down the pollution continues. And a number of years ago now, downstream of the sewage treatment works in Marlborough, a couple had a really, really poor score. And it was a site that normally has quite good river fly scores. And so that got reported to the Environment Agency. And when they came out and then they took away samples, it was found out it was a chemical called chlorpyrifos, which is an insecticide that had ended up in the um, sewage treatment works where someone had obviously put it down their sink or, and it had ended up in the, their sewage treatment works. And so in this incident, although it came from the water company, it was not the water company's fault because they're supposed to be dealing with um, poo, pee and paper, not chemicals like insecticides. And although it caused a pollution incident from Marlborough all the way down to Hungerford, the invertebrate life suffered, because we had gone out and surveyed and it had then got reported, it then stopped the company from discharging any more. So we actually prevented it from being even worse. So it made it onto the BBC and lots of newspapers and kind of showed that citizen science and getting out river fly monitoring is really important because the water looked crystal clear and beautiful. So unless you were in there sampling and looking for the creatures and then finding out they were then either dead dying or in low numbers, you would never have known and this it would have continued and got worse. The river had recovered from that, but it did take a number of months and then probably over a year for the further away parts to totally recover. And people were very worried about what would happen to the fish, given that the invertebrate life had been wiped out. But after um, various other studies and electrofishing happening, it, the fish actually were feeding off of terrestrial insects that were falling in off of that vegetation at the edge of the river. And so the fish didn't suffer, which kind of shows the importance of having those plants along the edge, because otherwise there wouldn't have been the land based insects falling into the river for them to kind of support them. This is just showing you about us out doing our water vole surveying. And also we have volunteers who do mink raft checking. We have to keep an eye out for American mink because they are an invasive species and they can decimate water vole populations. So along with river keepers, we have these mink rafts, which are floating kind of devices tethered to the riverbank with a clay plate on. And every week the footprints are checked. And if it normally it's nice and you just find water vole footprints or bird footprints, but Zoe there, if she lifts it up and she finds there are mink footprints, then it gets changed for a trap and then we have to check it every single day. So that's really important kind of checking to make sure that our voles keep thriving and that mink don't. And then the circled picture is a picture of otter spraint, which we're always very excited to find because if we find fresh otter spraint, it obviously means even though we haven't seen an otter, we know that they're there. And um, yeah, lots of otter spraint found over the past few years when we've been out surveying or when we're doing our practical in river work, we'll come across it. And one of the giveaway signs of is it otter sprained or not is otter poo doesn't actually smell disgusting, whereas most other animal poo does. So with a glove on, we sometimes have a sniff <laughs> to kind of check what it is. And it, most of the time it's also full of either fish scales and often the exoskeletons of the American signal crayfish. So otters are doing a really good job of eating lots of American crayfish, which is great because they're another non-native invasive species that are unfortunately on the increase. So when we're out water vole surveying, which we do in a team and we're out in our waders with broom poles parting vegetation and we're looking for the water vole droppings, we're looking for that diagonal chewed off vegetation and sometimes you'll find the like the bottom right hand picture what we call a feeding station where the water voles got all their little stems all chewed ready there and so if we find those and they're all fresh we know that there's lots of water vole about and sometimes we're really lucky and we actually get to see them that picture on the left was someone who'd come on we ran some public vole strolls last year and that was um, of someone who'd come along to learn about voles and had a very good camera and got that picture of the water vole amongst the watercress. So that was very nice. I'd mentioned earlier obstacle eels, which was part of this Thames catchment community eels project. So ARC were working with three other rivers trusts, all 
trying to identify and then score these different obstacles to eels for passability. And that was of um, staff were trained by ZSL, so Zoological Society of London, and then Mia with the glasses on her head in the picture, she's our eel project officer, and she then trained volunteers how to map and assess these barriers, and that's now she's busy working to identify what barriers need to be removed, and then the next step from that is us liaising with the Environment Agency, which we have to do quite a lot to see um, what's feasible to, for us to start planning to try and get funding to remove. Um, one of my favourite elements of my job is doing all the education work with schools. So we do a project called Water Matters at the moment, and we also do a project called River School. Um, we're working with last year, even through all the strangeness of COVID, we did a combination of Zooming with school children and then doing outdoor projects once that was kind of permitted again, of getting children outdoors and in the river having fun, but finding bullheads and sticklebacks and shrimp and learning a lot about them. And we worked with, it was just over a thousand school children last year. And hopefully we'll work with at least that many again this year. And also we're keen to work with groups of beavers, brownies, cubs, getting them all outdoors. We do events in the evenings and at weekends to try and accommodate as many different groups as possible. Um, anywhere within the Kennet or the Pan catchment. And that's through a variety of different funding sources. At the moment, if anyone is shopping in Hungerford Tesco's, we'd urge you to support us with tokens because that will fund our river school, some of our river school sessions this year. And we've worked also with Ramsbury Estates have been very good doing a fundraising event for us. And that money has gone to help fund some of our river schools we'll be doing this year as well. Um, our Love the Lambourne project started last year. Um, that was a double mattress that was saturated, we found on the riverbed of the River Lambourne. And um, it took quite a long time to heave that out of the water because it was probably one of the heaviest things we've ever had to pull out. Um, but we got it out along with many other trolleys and sacks of rubbish. And then once we'd done a lot of days of litter picking, we then moved on to doing some practical river restoration. And that's been going really well. And we will be continuing that in the summer this year. And that we had our regular volunteers, but equally we advertised it to try and get more local people out and with us helping. And that went really well. So I'm just gonna see if this will play. That was just a bit more of the footage that the same man who filmed the fish for us before did and that was again filmed in Hungford just kind of showing the amount of beautiful wildlife from the mayfly to the ducklings to the trout that we've got on our doorstep and why it's so important that we all try and play our bit to continue to look after our rivers. I'm just going to oh so again. if anyone is interested in joining our we are a membership organization and people can join them as an individual or as a family and we sometimes run sort of exclusive events for our members so some people are members some people are volunteers and some people are both and we're grateful to whichever or if you want to do both that's even better and uh, with there's a join today form on our website you can't join online but you can down it's quite old-fashioned you can download uh, a form and fill that in and post it into us and I just put, because I know that you've had a lot of problems in um, Lambourne with your water. There are a couple, three links there, and I, I can always send them to Penny afterwards to email around that I didn't know if they would be of any use to do, use to you. There is a consultation on flood risk management from the EA that closes at the end of this week. And so that's a public consultation. So if any of you are interested in filling that in, I'd urge you to do so. Um, with Thames water drainage strategies, and some of you might be used to looking at these things, but um, I, the one, the Lambourne is not on there at the moment, which maybe is because there's work being done on that because 
um, the Marlborough one is on there, but that is the website to look for drainage plans. And at the top is the standard wastewater management, which there is going to be another consultation this summer. And so that's the link to that if you want to have direct input into those. So ARC put in our own input into them, but a lot of these things, absolutely anybody can take the time and throw in their opinions to these consultations, which I urge everyone to do. I'm just going to go on to the next one. So that's just to say thank you very much. And I will stop screen sharing. Um, and for anyone that wasn't here at the beginning, this is George, who is our new Ark Otter, who's very enormous. He was sadly hit by a car in between the River Og and the Kennet about a year ago. And someone reported to me that there was a dead otter that was now on the side of the road. So we went and collected him. And he went off, first of all, to Cardiff University Otter Project, which is a long term study on otters. So they kind of gave him an autopsy and took samples of his bone, his teeth, his fat and his muscles so they could find out about the state of his health before he was sadly hit by a car. And then after that, he's been to the taxidermist and we've had him stuffed to be our educational otter so he can come out with me when I'm talking to school children and other people to kind of show one how enormous an adult male otter is and two you know we're actually very lucky to have creatures this magnificent living in our rivers so I hope that was interesting for you and if you've got any questions about anything I haven't covered I'm really happy to answer them for you anyone has uh, um any questions at all? You jump yeah, in. I, I've, I've got a question. Um, don't know if you want to see me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Always. <laughs> Penny here in East Garston. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about have, um, uh, plants along the river bank. Um, we live in the centre of East Garston and have a fair length of bank. We live right on the river. Mm. But um, and I was interested to hear what you said about sedge. Was it sedge? Yes. But obviously our river is dry, you know, for four or five months of the year. So can we still plant stuff like sedge along the banks? Will yeah. it survive? Sometimes things like sedge and flag iris, although they are kind of plants that like the damp, they will hang on in there. So if you, when you've got water in there, you get planting then, hopefully the plants and plant roots will take hold and will hang on in there because there's times when bits of river dry up totally and still those kind of plants hang on in there so I kind of think it's it's worth having a go because it really is it's such a good thing to do we have lots of people who say oh why have we got bank erosion or why don't we see water bowls anymore and then you visit and they've strimmed everything into oblivion and haven't put the two together but or people also have, if we get a lot of calls about people who have got um, watercress growing right across when the river's really dry, and that's actually doing a really good job because it's the chalk stream just narrowing its channel so that if there is still a little bit of water, it will keep flowing through that really small channel. So if people pull it all out, you're going to have even less flow if there is water in there because it's obviously needs, if there's less water, it needs a narrow channel to keep the momentum going. So, okay, and where does one buy sedge and flag iris from? Where's okay, the so I wouldn't ever say go to a garden centre if you're planting it in the actual river because, you know, garden centres have got lots of hybridised plants, but I can send, there's a company called Salix and they, you can only buy in whole trays, but depending on how long your riverbank is, you might use a whole tray of stuff. They're really good. Or another, um, there are stuff online is called British Flora. And they, both those sites, it's kind of good provenance and proper native plants. And that's, if we are using a lot of plants and we have to buy in, those are the companies we tend to go to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about quite a lot of meterage of bank, both sides. Yeah. And the more you order, the cheaper it gets. So if it's a bigger order, it will work out cheaper per plug plant and even when the plug if you order in plugs and they look quite small and insignificant generally the success rate is very good because okay. there's 
you know, the plants like in that slide when I said sometimes things like purple loose strife, which is a really beautiful marginal plant, you know, it goes in like that if we're doing it in spring and by the middle of summer, you know, it's really tall with those beautiful long purpley flowers on. And yeah. Thank you. Good. Could I ask um, uh, about, um, we talked about agricultural runoff. Um, what about industrial runoff? I mean, where we are in, in, in Lambourne Parish, we've got um, the industrial area uh, up in Lambourne Woodlands, um, which having looked at the maps, um, I mean, obviously it's all Kennet catchment, but um, certainly on the sort of Southern side of the motorway, anything eventually drains into the Kennet, whereas on the northern side, it tends to go into the Lambourne first before it finishes up in the Kennet. Yeah. Um, so is there, you know, do you, do you see traces of industrial runoff and that sort of thing? Or, yeah, so, so that kind of runoff is still obviously really awful. And like when you have, you know, the road surface runoff is really bad because when you've got all the chemicals that are going in. So we don't do chemical testing ourselves but we know that it is having an impact and along with lots of other things and that's why again any kind of filtration that can be put in is a really good thing because the last thing you want is any of these things directly going into the water yeah yeah um, actually you mentioning the um uh the the road runoff um i was walking around eastbury yesterday and um, noticed that um, the, the grips, you know, the, the, the drains from the road um, or the sort of the ditching from the road into a ditch or, of course, in Eastbury, it's going into the river. Um, and I didn't know from what you were saying whether there was any way of, I don't know, protecting or filtering that because, you know, some of these some of these sort of drainage channels from the road are actually quite big. Um, and I could imagine quite a lot of um, gunk off it, the road goes in straight into the river. It is horrendous. And there's, there's just various places when we've tried to make some inquiries. I think if it was if all these things were being built now, it theoretically wouldn't be permitted to have all this stuff just to go straight in. But it's kind mm. of there's not like when we built the wetland at Stonebridge to filter the road surface runoff because there was the space to do so but in yes. in, in yes. lots and then in we we would like to in Shelbourne there's another the steep um road down into Sh Shelbourne and all the runoff every time it rains is taking our agricultural runoff and road runoff huge amounts in and so as a kind of starting point we create we've planted up an edge there but what would be better would be to kind of have channels leading off into wetlands because mm. that would be a be able to deal with more than what we've done at the moment yeah yeah i was just sort of thinking that these are you know relatively short distances and it's uh, um it is sort of near enough the river is roadside and and it's probably yeah, and so it's just ten foot is the most you'd probably get to uh, to do it. But I I was rather struck by how <laughs> wide some of these channels were. They must take a lot of water straight into the river. And the other thing we've tried to do, we've got um, there's more about it on our website. A thing called um, which Charlotte, our director, led on called Muddy Walks, and I have to check with her if the app is still running. But it was asked, which I think it is. It's it's asking people if you're out when it's raining and you notice runoff going straight into the river right. at any point to log it on this app. Or if you can't find our app, just email it in to us because we yeah. would then put it in. And it's not saying we can solve everything, but the more we know about, yeah. the more, you know, information is really yeah. important because often there are simple ways sometimes of dealing with these things and and sometimes it can be management of a landowner might be really receptive to a different way of managing something to avoid so much runoff going in yep yeah yeah all right thank you yes i'll uh, i'll have a look at that yes hmm. right another couple of questions if i don't know the whole <laughs> yeah forum but uh, 
obviously with the river dry at the moment, but it is coming back. Um, we've been clearing out um, a lot of the weed, the kind of dead weed that's on the gravel, because I'm aware that you need to keep the gravel clean um, from last year because we didn't clear it out at the end of last season. So should we just keep pulling out as much as we can of the dead stalks that are kind of brown rather than the green growth? Um, so is it the reason for pulling it out? Because say with sometimes with gravel riverbeds, um, generally, I mean, if there was water in it, we would say not be doing anything now because it would be just, um, you know, interfering with the fish spawning. Um, but we wouldn't say for people to keep on and on doing stuff with the gravel all the time, because otherwise, if there's invertebrate life in there, it's going to be disturbing it too much. So sometimes when people do um, an old fashioned way was when people used to sometimes rake gravel or sometimes people would kind of jet spray the gravel just to kind of loosen it up so that it's suitable for fish spawning. Um, but we don't. Our, we don't go around doing any kind of pulling up any anything if it's a native plant. So is it what plant is it that you're kind of pulling? Oh, gosh, um, I think I can see Karen and James on here. I forgot. Is it ranunculus? It's the one that's got a really strong smell. Um, um, it's kind of aniseedy. I can't think of, because um, because ranunculus is the kind of the flowing mm. pretty one with the flowers. And I would never I wouldn't be pulling that up. Um, I've just got, got so confused over the years because some, you know, the SS, it used to be do this, don't that. Because originally, going back, the EA used to advocate, and they have reworded it, but still not clearly enough, that it kind of clearing is kind of a bit like when dredging used to be thought as a good thing, and now it very much is not give the advice, you know, it's Ill illegal to be doing it. Because generally, if there'd be no reason to be really pulling it up. Okay. And I mean, if you could send pictures or anything, that would be useful, but. Okay, I'll send you some pictures, thank you. Um, and my final question is about seeding the um, ducks and boar hens. A controversial um, one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have neighbors, we're surrounded by people who've been feeding them for decades, probably. And mm. we have 20, 30 more hens in the, you know, waiting for the delivery to come back already. And, it just upsets me when I witness the ducks drowning each other's ducklings and I'm shouting <coughs> ducks to um, stop it. I mean, I'm, it was horrible to watch. It, it is horrendous. I mean, yeah. assume it's because there's too much, it's overpopulated. Mm. It's, we know we're never going to, I grew up with my mum taking me to the river to feed, but it was like a crust of bread, whereas now people pour out whole loaves of bread. And the ducks don't need feeding, but I know we're never going to convince everybody of that um, because people go, they look hungry. And I mean, a duck doesn't really have an expression. <laughs> they, 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 it's how we're, we're interpreting it. There is plenty of natural food for ducks and more hens and they will, the population will be more natural and they will be healthier creatures feeding on what's in the river. And so I know that feeding ducks is a way of people feeling connecting with it. So I totally kind of get it, but it's one of those things of, um, or the other argument people, well, I've always fed them. And that isn't really a good argument because it's kind of, once you kind of are educated about it and you think actually we're doing it for ourselves really, not the ducks um, or the more hens. So it's, it is better not to and often if people are leaving copious amounts of whatever they're feeding like obviously feeding them proper seed is better than bread but it's still meaning you're having an artificially high population potentially and it's still promoting an unnatural behavior and so it's it's really best not to do it and also it encourages rats if there's loads of food left out on riverbanks you're just going to end up with lots of rats and rats like to eat duck eggs and more hen eggs, and they like to eat the young of wild fowl. So sometimes when people say, where have all the ducks gone? And you kind of think, well, sometimes, you know, that's a, a thing that sometimes crops up in Marlborough. Well, if you keep helping the rat population, you're going to have a dip in your bird population. So we've got, um, on our website, it isn't telling people what to do because we can't tell them, but it's a co it, it, there's in a drop down called Keep Wildlife Wild. And it's kind of just got information. And then we kind of hope people will make a decision based on what they've <coughs> said. 
but yeah it is a challenge to try and change people's views on that yep right penny um i've really enjoyed your talk anna it's been fascinating and and so wide ranging um i was fascinated to know that in lambourne the uh, river is did you really say 10 degrees colder so than... it, so the chalk streams are generally about 10 degrees but the lambourne is even colder <laughs> it's not 10 degrees Colder, okay but it's it is yeah. significantly colder the first yeah. time i ever got into a deep bit of the river lambourne compared to the kennet you could feel it was definitely a little <laughs> bit colder yeah. it is famous it is famously cold in lambourne um i thought it was fantastic you were obviously so diplomatic when you come to talking you know to farmers and to um gardeners and so on and approaching them with a very sympathetic air and to educate them which is great um, but could you just say to me about the um the spawning um it's happening now and yeah. how long uh, you said you know avoid letting dogs go in the river and obviously here in Lambourne it'll be horses but um for how long so the spawning season starts in November and carries on till March okay but, um it's when you've got they depending on what but it starts further down the river earlier so say in Chilton Foliot the trout were spawning before Christmas whereas mm. now they've only just started spawning in Marlborough so it's kind of mm. that's how it's spanned out but mm. if people still want to there was a man I was out on Sunday morning at Cooper's Meadow in Marlborough and I saw I was stood there watching these trout spawning and creating a nest and then he just totally oblivious hurled his ball in and the dog went running through and so I just said oh could I just tell you about something and, <laughs> and because and sometimes you can be as nice as you want and someone will ignore you and you, and you can't I can't stop them but I can kind of most of the time I think if you're nice to people and just try and make them aware they will go your way with things and mm. and he said to me oh right and I said but further that way is the weir pool and your dog could go in and out of the weir pool because trout don't spawn in a deep weir pool they want the nice clean gravel and the flow of the channel so he mm. just went there for his dog to go in and out and therefore left the trout to kind of get on with their business so I know I can't be at there giving people information all the time but hopefully he'll chat to an other dog walkers and kind mm. of spread the word that it's not anti-dog it's just most people, if you've got a dog, you wouldn't send it in when it's bird nesting season along where you knew birds were nesting. And mm. I, so it's that kind of thing about trying to get people to know about the, the trout. Mm. So, yes. Mm. Because yeah. how do you know? Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Just, just, just on the similar front, Anna, I know you, you haven't done much as a, uh, uh, done much work on the Lambourne, but have you any evidence of how far up the river Lambourne, up to Lambourne, that fish actually do spawn. Because... So I'm hoping Sorry. this year to have a little bit more data because we're obviously reliant on volunteers to go out and do the red spotting. And we've got um, a couple of volunteers this year who are out walking different stretches. So I'm waiting to ha have data from them, which would give us more of an idea. Mm. But um, when anywhere where there's basically clean gravel and good flow and there are fish there there should be spawning if it's covered in kind of silt then there sh there, there won't be no. that's that's you, the, the the silt is the main problem in, in the in the head you know right at the head of the river up in oxford street there is there are two two um road uh, drains which take an awful lot of the village rainwater so the stretch that we're next to um there's two or three inches of silt in there every year and I, I clean the, the, the weed out which is the um, uh, not the, the ranunculus the, the good stuff um, because there is so much um, silt underneath it but obviously being the the winter born and if it is uh, dry for a couple of months it's 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 down river as far as uh, East Garston or further that the water's flowing which mm. might, might be where the, the spawning does take place but um yeah and if any of you have got um 
polarized sunglasses. They're a great way of seeing through the glare and being able to spot these underwater nests. So a lot of the fishermen wear polarized glasses for kind of seeing through the water better. And so, and every winter we normally hold normally a red spotting morning, which is just an interesting morning to walk along a stretch of river with us and kind of see these nests firsthand and learn a bit more about it. And it there, it's a free thing. It's open to anybody and you're not obliged to come and volunteer because you've been on it. We kind of open it for anyone who's interested just because it's another way of people learning a bit more about their river. So if it's worth visiting our website because or Facebook because we put kind of everything on there of our events and most of our events are free to attend. Right. Okay. Are there any more questions from anyone? If you're bursting to ask a question and you're, nothing's happening, do unmute. Uh, <laughs> right. No. Well, I think, as Penny said, that was absolutely fascinating. And I think just a few moments ago, I think possibly Margaret may have raised her head above your shoulder, but it might have been a um uh, uh, <laughs> she's, she's she's out at the, the bottom of oh, the she's there. yes it could it could well have been her yes she, yeah. she sort of appeared suddenly sorry i was i was digressing um <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes uh, as penny said uh, fascinating and wide ranging i mean uh, there's just so much information there and and uh, certainly from my point of view i'd not really thought about if you like the the cross section of the river from the trees to the marginal um, plants to what's actually happening in the centre of the river and, and uh, how it all comes together to make uh, one of these, these rare chalk streams. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you very, very much for um, giving us a, a really great talk this evening and, and, uh, and bringing George um, as well. But uh, thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been really lovely to meet you all and hopefully one day see everybody in person. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And if I could say thank you to everybody for attending uh, uh, this evening. Um, keep your eyes open for our next uh, event, uh, which I hope will be in February. Uh, but uh, um, we will be advertising once we know what we're doing. So, uh, um, uh, but... Uh, uh, as I say, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. That's right.